So I want to talk a little bit about how Paul says, both in Romans 8, uh, 7, sorry, and 2 Corinthians 3, that the letter kills. When he's talking about the law, he says the letter kills, but the spirit gives life. And uh, I like to use Cain and Abel as a picture of taking the word according to the letter and taking it according to the spirit. Uh, let me say first that this taking it all the way through the scriptures to, to take it according to the spirit is not a mystical exercise of you being in the spirit or something like that while you read it and touching something supernatural. It is the spirit has always been supplied through the gospel. And I've been talking about that in Galatians that, uh, the faith in the gospel, which focuses on the crucified Christ, his work brings the spirit as the blessing. When you believe the gospel, you're blessed. And that blessing is the spirit. And so he says, did you receive the spirit by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? Having, are you so foolish having begun in the spirit? Are you now going to be perfected in the flesh? Right? Does he who supplies to you the spirit and does miracles among you do so by the works of the law or the hearing of faith? The hearing of faith is how God supplies the spirit. And so the spirit, when Paul says the law, the letter kills, but the spirit gives life, he means the spirit as it is supplied through the gospel. And in 2 Corinthians 3, he's talking about the ministry of righteousness, which is the gospel that brings people to behold the glory of God shining in the face of Jesus Christ as we consider his person and his work. We are supplied with the spirit. And that is how we move from point A to point B in the Christian life. And, you know, I said that we see that in Abraham, the God of glory kept visiting him. He kept getting, quote, stuck in his life with uh, kind of like in the flesh. You know, he was stuck in Haran. He didn't. He, it took God pushing him forward to keep him moving. And that pushing forward was by the infusion of faith through the appearing of God and the word which announced to him the gospel again and again and again, focusing him back on the seed that was promised, on the promise of God. And that seed is Christ. So even Abraham lived ultimately by being supplied through the hearing of faith that brought him back to focus his attention on God's promise concerning his seed, which is Christ. Same way we do, we are supplied with the Spirit and move forward by being brought again and again back to focus our attention on Christ himself, his person and his work. That is the source of our supply. That's why the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. Not just going to heaven when you die, but even more our salvation here on earth, which is uh, our, just as much. You know, we need to be saved every day from ourselves and our unrenewed mind and our disposition and our situations and be brought into the spirit so that we can hold forth the word of life. That is uh, the focus. So in contrast to that is the letter. Now, the letter is still the Bible. Both the gospel and the letter are in the Bible. The word which is spirit and life, it's either that to you or it's the letter and a good example of this is Cain and Abel you know hold on so I had to leave the house for a minute and take care of a couple things uh so I'll have to splice these two together anyway as I was saying about Cable and a Cain and Abel um you know when Adam and Eve uh were sent out of the garden they were told that they would have to toil, you know, and bring forth the fruit of the ground uh, for for bread, you know, out of the, with the sweat of their brow, the toil and the effort of their labor, 
and that the ground was cursed now so it wasn't going to bring forth fruit they were going to have to work really hard at it and uh i think our world today after the flood is likely blessed because of the covenant god made with noah i i think things may have been worse before the flood after uh the fall i don't know um but still the toil was in view right and Eve was told she would with sorrow bring forth children I mean the whole situation changed because of the fall well those words would have been very powerful for them I mean that is the description of what their life is going to be like now and it came from God so they have that but then God we know slew an animal and uh, covered them with its skins. And we know that that's the first um, bloodshed in the Bible, the first death that they ever saw. And we know in a way it's substitutionary because they were supposed to die, and yet they didn't. They were covered by this garment of a creature that did die. But there was no explanation, at least the way the scripture records it, we don't see an explanation for that right um now they have Cain and Abel and Cain becomes a tiller of the ground and Abel becomes a shepherd well this what they became is based on their vision of what God wants so Abel's vision came from that sacrifice about which there really wasn't any word he became a shepherd at a time when people were not eating meat so it wasn't that he was providing food for everybody you could say well he was providing clothes so that was useful but you know compared to the toil the sweat of the brow to bring forth the fruit of the earth his labor was relatively light right but we know that he had Christ in view and salvation in view because Jesus called him a prophet when he said that the blood of this generation is going to come of all, of the blood of all the prophets uh, is going to come on this generation you're going to be accountable for the blood that was shed from Abel all the way to Zechariah between the altar and the temple. Abel had an altar and he was a prophet according to Jesus. And all the way through the scriptures, the, the what identifies a prophet is the testimony of Christ. Because the scripture says that uh, the spirit of prophecy is the testimony of Jesus Christ. And Peter says that the prophets were eagerly seeking and inquiring into the matters concerning the sufferings of Christ and the glories to follow. That was their focus. That's what made them a prophet, is what they saw concerning Christ. Abel was a prophet. Abraham was also called a prophet, by the way. And the reason he was a prophet was because he also had a vision of Christ. In fact, his work in Genesis 22 was based on his faith in the resurrection. He knew that he would receive Isaac back from the dead if necessary because God had promised that through his seed all the nations would be blessed. So if he was to kill Isaac, then resurrection had to happen. That's why he, his, that's why he obeyed by faith. His faith enabled him to obey. So that faith was not faithfulness. It was faith in the sense of believing God's promise concerning Christ. Well, Abel had the same kind of faith. And when Abel all offered his sacrifice, Jesus tells us there was an altar there. And he offered the lamb with the fat portion. Well, that prefigures the priesthood and the offerings uh, that God decreed through Moses. So definitely he knew what he was doing and that was his righteousness 
So, the sacrifice of the lamb was his participation in faith in acknowledging his belief in God's promise about their redemption and it was based on the vision that was shown as the parents Adam and Eve would recount the story of the fall they surely talked about what God had said and also what God had done and what God did was sacrifice the animal so that they could be covered and not die that would have had a profound effect on them and that's what Abel focused on Cain, on the other hand, offers from the toil, from the fruit of the ground, and his offering was rejected. And it's because he toiled and sweated to bring forth something from that which God had cursed and thought that he would be blessed for doing so. Well, where did he get that idea? Well, God said that we need to toil and sweat and work and bring fruit from the earth. That must be what he wants. So that is based on God's in spoken instruction with no vision of God's work. And that is really the difference. The letter that kills is based on having instructions from God without a vision of his work. Abel doesn't seem to acknowledge God's instruction. You know, you don't see him out there digging in the dirt, bringing forth the fruit of his toil. He becomes a shepherd. He acknowledges what he saw of God's work. And he was considered righteous and a prophet because he saw something. So when we are in the Bible, we don't go looking for God's instruction and commands without considering his work. We look to his work primarily, first and foremost, and really it becomes the whole Bible to us because now we're always looking for, okay, yes, this is what God said, but what did he do? You know, and that's the gospel. Now, in the Reformation, they made a big thing about rightly dividing the word meant distinguishing between law and gospel. The law demands what we cannot fulfill, whereas the gospel promises for God to fulfill what the law could not produce in us because of our weakness. The gospel not only promises to fulfill it, but actually brings the supply of the Spirit to do it. So I think John Bunyan said, you know, the gospel gives me wings to fly. And uh, so this is really the difference. And it, it's all the way through the scripture, the line of life versus the line from the letter or from the law or from, and the letter kills. So this actually produces two different manners of living. One is a living by faith in God's promise not endeavoring to try to fulfill outward instructions but to be propelled forward by the supply of the spirit through the hearing of faith as God visits you with revelation concerning his person and work the focus is entirely on him and then there is the other line which is well, this is what God said, therefore I must do it. And the illusion or the deception with the other one is that you think you're going to be blessed for doing what God said. So Cain, in his mind, had every right to expect blessing for offering up the toil of his, the, you know, the produce, produce of his labor and toil and sweat, the sweat of his brow, even though the ground was cursed because God had said it and he had simply followed God's instructions. He's a law keeper. He's a, he's a legalist in the way he approaches the Bible or approaches God. He's looking for God to give him something to do so that he can then do it and be blessed. But 
Paul shows us, in Galatians especially, that the blessing of Abraham comes on those who believe by faith. And that is our status as, it, it makes us heirs, co-heirs with Christ, who is the true heir of Abraham, to whom the promise and the blessing was made. So we do not toil to bring forth things that satisfy God in order to then be paid with a blessing. We are already blessed. And it's to the degree that we see that we are blessed and our heart becomes thankful that we actually see uh, the fruit of it in our life, which is joy and peace. It doesn't mean we don't go through troubles and stuff, but we have a sense of blessing. And, you know, Paul says we've been blessed with every spiritual blessing in the heavenlies in Christ. Everything that is in Christ is ours. We've already been blessed. We're not waiting for God to bless us. We're not looking for something to do so that God will respond to us by blessing as if that blessing is then a payment for our work. That's not... And, and so we increasingly get away from having a legalistic letter-based approach of the Bible. So when we come to the Bible, we're not looking for some commandment to keep so that we can be blessed. And it changes your whole approach. You can relax. You, it actually brings a rest that actually causes you to relax, like physiologically, psychologically, as well as spiritually. You can relax. You know, when you're a legalist, you are toiling and sweating and laboring to bring forth something that God could bless. And you always think that you're not blessed, but you need to get blessed. So it's always held out in front of you like a carrot that you have to strive for. And that's why it brings you into bondage. That's not our approach at all. Our approach is, thank you, Lord. You have blessed me. You know, we give in the New Testament, we're not tithing so that we can get something from God. You know, he says, oh, see, test me in this and I'll open up the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing that you can't contain. So everybody goes and gives 10% of their income because God said it, you know. And if you don't, you're cursed, right? That's law. No, I'm blessed. I have the blessing of Abraham. My, whatever I put my hand to will prosper and, you know, I can be confident that God's taking care of me, not because of anything I do, but because I'm his child. And he provides richly. And honestly, I don't care about anything but food, clothing, you know, and housing. And with that, I need to be content. But he also adds more besides and continues to bless. And so when we give, it's just out of a generous heart, not a rule but because we're free to give because we know more money's coming. It's God's money. He always provides. And so it gives you a freedom about your finances that's a little that's different. And I remember when I used to be a legalist about money, I was always in anxiety about money, even though I made a lot. I had a job um, in IT. I was a project lead, and I was making really good income finally. And that was a big deal for me because I was always poor, you know. But I always worried about money worried about losing my house and I had all kinds of financial anxiety and I was giving 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 and tithing and then we gave hundreds of dollars each week for food because my wife made breakfast for the brothers at the uh, meeting hall before you know just and all the meals because we were together 35 hours a week in this little <laughs> church thing and we were doing that thinking that if we stopped the blessing would stop and I always had anxiety about money and then through a series of events I lost everything really and I stopped worrying I said I give up I'm tired I don't care all I want is to make sure I'm eating and make sure I'm clothed and and God, God takes care of that I'd lowered my expectation but then God came in and started to bless me and I even quit the job I don't do IT anymore and he has blessed and blessed and blessed and blessed and I give I do it is true I give less now than I used to because I used to give under obligation and fear now I do give but when I give it's just because I feel inspired to do so it's free will you know and I don't think that it's going to produce a blessing for me I'm already blessed 
So I'm not looking to sow in order to reap in that sense. Sowing to the Spirit means I'm believing the gospel and focusing my attention on that. And reaping eternal life, that all has to do with Christ and the Spirit. And then there's fruit, which means people being edified because there's someone who's got some freedom in Christ and he's happy about it and he's sharing it spontaneously and they enjoy that. That's There's fruit out of that. But that's very different than thinking you need to work for God in order to get him to pay you back, you know. And when I made when when I finally got to a place where I could make that kind of transition, it really did free me up. I haven't worried about finances the way I used to worry about them. And every once in a while you go, uh oh, you know, but it's really I God has always provided and I've seen it, He's proven his faithfulness. And it's not because I've done anything. It's because I'm blessed in Christ. And that blessing, part of that provision, is that God is my Father and He takes care of me. That may look like different things at different times, you know. Uh, there may be a seasonal leanness or something, but I, I, He's just been so good and I am so aware of it. So, that, so that, you know, the coming to the Bible as the letter produces an outward kind of Christianity that is focused on me, myself, and I, and I'm looking for something to do, and I'm looking for commandments. When I come to the scriptures, it's entirely based on what could, what's God trying to tell me to do today, you know? What would Jesus do comes out of that kind of concept. It's totally an outward instruction, not something of God wrought into your being through Christ by faith, by the Spirit, but you trying to be a doer of the word. Now, I know I keep coming back to it, but that comes back to James, you know. James presents a so-called practical Christian life that's based on the letter. It is, if you are a doer of the work, you will be blessed. What work? The work that the law instructs you to do. And so he who goes to the word and is a hearer and not a doer is a forgetful hearer, you know, and he forgets what kind of, he's not going to be blessed. And if, But if you are a doer of the work, you'll be blessed. So it's very, God responds to you based on your obedience. And that is not how the prophetic view of the Christian life is at all. The prophetic view of the Christian life that's from the apostolic ministry is focused on the person and work of Christ. And all of the admonitions in Paul's epistles and Peter and John, now those epistles also admonish plenty unto good works. You know, I would say that it's not that we are antinomian and because we have terminated our relationship to the law, we don't want to do good works and don't want to be holy. That's not true. The difference is, the dispute is the means. What is the means of holiness and good works? For us, it is our vision of the finished work of Christ. And the apostolic admonishment, if you want to call it that, is always based on the death of and the resurrection of Christ and you getting a vision of your position in him and then walking worthily of that calling. It's walking out what he works in, right? Work out your salvation because God is at work in you both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's a vision of God working in you. Not you going to the letter of the law looking for something to do so that God will respond to you, but it is you responding to the vision of Christ presented in the gospel and responding to the supply of the Spirit. So it's spontaneous. It's not like you go, oh, I'm so thankful for the gospel and I need to be thankful, so to show I'm thankful, I'm going to do X, Y, Z. No. It is, I'm so thankful for the gospel and then whatever I do in that state of thankfulness is good works. Whatever it is becomes an expression of Christ because the Spirit is flowing in that faith. You don't have to drum it up. That is Christ in me. 
That is, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me, and the life I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. It is a spontaneous thing where no matter what you're doing, whether secular or holy, it is all good works because Christ is flowing in you because your heart is satisfied with him by being focused on the truth of his testimony concerning his person and his work and really getting a hold of it and it becoming a vision that governed your life. That's what Abel had. Versus, you know, I need to show that I'm thankful and therefore I need to work. And if I work hard enough or good enough, God will bless me. But I can't expect any blessing if I'm not gonna work. And that's where Pastor So-and-So comes from, you know. He didn't even get your work. That is not what God is doing in the New Testament. He's producing something where our feeling spontaneously matches his. And what we do as a person constituted with Christ automatically satisfies God. Uh, and we're relaxed about it. And we're blessed. We're blessed first, and then we do. And what we do is not us, but Christ in us. And yet it's still us because we are the branch of the vine, as I keep saying. So I hope this helps. Um, I don't know if... Uh, I'll, I'll probably have to do more about this, but, you know, this is the contrast of the law and the gospel. And you have to keep it real distinct. And when you read the Bible, you do have to get to a point where you learn to get the burden of the law off yourself. And the law consists not only of the Ten Commandments, but every demand God makes in all the scriptures. You know, you think that if you don't forgive this brother, God's not going to forgive you. Well, now you're putting, you're back in the old system. And you are trying to merit God's blessing by your work. And that actually does not free you to love your brother and forgive him. It actually keeps you in the agony of the situation by getting you to focus on you and your situation and now you're in the flesh and it just strengthens the flesh no you forget about the brother for a minute and come to the lord and enjoy him and feast on christ and look to him and forget about my situation lord i can't fix it anyway i can't be the, my brother's psychologist or comforter only you can i'm not his christ and i'm not his savior if he's offended, I apologize, Lord. I can't fix that. If you show me what I can say to make the situation better, you know, flow through me in that way. Change my heart. But until until that's happening, I'm just going to focus on you. Now, that doesn't mean you go steal from somebody and don't give it back if you know you've wronged someone. I'm talking about the complicated situations where there's strife there and there's no way you can fix it. And you're all entangled with it, you know. Your answer is not to try to sit there and deal with that situation. Your answer has to be Christ. And he has to save you from that situation and save that other person from it. You're not going to be able to... Once you've offended someone, you can't unoffend them. Only the Lord can do that. And we do offend each other all the time. So we have to be uh, aware, you know. So um, anyway, just a little side note, but just continuing to try to help describe these situations so that we can get more and more free from the legalism that we are ensnared in in various degrees. I don't know of anybody who is not a legalist at some level. We all are in either relationships or in our inward condition and how we feel or towards God's law, we are legalists. And we need to be set free by the knowledge of the truth. So I'm going to keep talking about that. See ya.